Note 2007, Chapter 9, Somatosensory System. Contents, somatosensory receptors, including two sections, cutaneous and subcutaneous receptors, and muscle receptors. Second, distribution of somatosensory information in the central nervous system, including a subsection for reflexes. Third, touch and position, posterior column medial lemin, uh, lemniscus pathway. Fourth, pain and temperature anterior lateral pathway, including a section on control of pain transmission. Sensory receptors of different types, as indicated in Chapter 4, are specialized in distinctive ways, but also have some common organizing principles. The same is true of the CNS systems to which these receptors provide information. So this chapter reviews not just the specific properties of the somatosensory system, but also the ways in which it resembles or differs from the other sensory systems discussed in the four subsequent chapters. Somatosensory receptors. We use the somatosensory system as the basis for perceiving a variety of modalities and submodalities. Touch, texture, the position of body parts, pain, temperature, tickle, itch, and others by combining the information provided by multiple kinds of receptors. With one possible exception, all of them are receptors with long axons. In general, those for touch and position have large diameter, heavily myelinated axons, and those for pain and temperature have small diameter, thinly myelinated, or unmyelinated axons. The receptive endings of large diameter fibers are mechanoreceptors that typically have either connective tissue capsules or accessory structures that filter mechanical stimuli in some way, as seen in Table 9.1. The receptive endings of small diameter fibers, in contrast, are typically free nerve endings with no obvious anatomic specializations, even though some of them respond selectively to painful stimuli, others to innocuous temperature changes or light touch. Here's Table 9.1, uh, major somatosensory receptor types including a column for ending type, we'll look at free nerve endings, location is ubiquitous, responds to pain, temperature, and light touch. Second ending type is encapsulated endings. Receptor types include Meissner corpsicles, Pacinian corpsicles, muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs. Location for Meissner corpsicles is glabrous skin, and Meissner corpsicles respond to changing touch. Pacinian corpsicles are located in skin joints and deep connective tissue and respond to vibration. Muscle spindles are located in skeletal muscles and respond to muscle stretch. Golgi tendon organs are located in, muscle ten in the muscle tendon junction and respond to muscle tension. Endings with accessory structures um, include receptor types Merkel endings and endings around hairs. Merkel endings are located in glabrous and hairy skin and respond to touch. Endings around hairs are located in hairy skin and respond to touch. Cutaneous and subcutaneous receptors touch receptors, the receptors that provide the information we use for the discriminative aspects of touch, assessing the shape and texture of objects and the direction of movement across the skin, all have large diameter axons and encapsulated endings or endings with accessory structures. Prominent examples of this category are Meissner corpsicles, Pacinian corpsicles, and Merkel endings. The packing density of receptors like this, especially the Meissner corpsicles and Merkel endings, determines the tactile acuity of a given area of skin. 
this varies quite a bit from the fingertips and lips where we can distinguish between two small objects separated by only a few millimeters to the skin of the legs and trunk where objects can be separated by a few centimeters and still feel like a single object. Here we have figure 9-1. got our, right here, our Merkel cell and Merkel ending, hairy skin on the outside, glabrous skin on the right-hand side, We've got our free nerve ending, Meisner corpsicle, Merkel ending, and our hair receptor. Here's a Piscinian corpsicle and the peripheral nerve bundle. Here's the epiderm epidermis, the outer skin layer, and the dermis, the inner skin layer. This is a figure of the major cutaneous and subcutaneous receptors. Meisner corpsicles found in the dermal papillae of glabrous or hairless skin are encapsulated structures containing flattened discs of Schwann cell cytoplasm piled up like a stack of pancakes one or more large diameter axons enter the capsule and wind back and forth between the Schwann cell discs. Pushing on the skin compresses the receptive ending, but the Schwann cells and capsule filter out sustained indentations, making this a rapidly adapting receptor. Meisner corpsicles are important for detecting the details of things moving across the skin. They come into play when we move our fingertips across something or when something in our grasp begins to slip and distorts the skin. Piscinian corpsicles, widespread and subcutaneous connective tissue, have a multi-layered capsule shaped like an onion in cross-section. The layers act as a mechanical filter, see figure 49A, making this a very rapidly adapting receptor that responds briefly at the beginning and end of a mechanical stimulus. This makes Piscinian corpsicles good at detecting rapidly changing stimuli such as vibrations. Merkel endings, abundant in both glabrous and hairy skin, are the flattened sensory terminals of large diameter axons applied to Merkel cells in the basal layer of the epidermis. Merkel endings are sensitive, slowly adapting receptors important for detecting the shape and texture of stationary objects touching the skin. Merkel cells are thought by some to be the actual receptor cells because they make what look like synaptic contacts on Merkel endings, but definitive evidence is lacking. Other receptors involved in detecting tactile stimuli include sensory endings wrapped around the bases of hairs and a recently discovered population of unmyelinated fibers with free nerve endings and hairy skin that respond best to slow, gentle brushing of the skin. The C-fiber touch receptors are probably more important for the pleasurable feelings associated with this kind of touch than for its explicit detection. See chapter 18. Receptors for coolness and warmth. The receptors for conscious awareness of innocuous temperature changes are all free nerve endings. Those for cooling have thinly myelinated axons, and those for warming have unmyelinated axons. These are different receptors from those that detect painful heat and cold, see figure 404. Nociceptors. Receptors that detect events that damage or threaten to damage tissue are grouped together as nociceptors. One might imagine that the receptors for painful stimuli would have the largest, most rapid conducting axons, but in fact the need for speed is greater in the receptors used to coordinate escape and nociceptors have small diameter axons. Some are thinly myelinated fibers and others are C-fibers. These two groups of nociceptors correspond to everyone's experience with pain as a two-part sensation. A physically painful event, example given touching a very hot spot or hot pot, missing a nail and hitting a finger with the hammer, elicits first a sensation of sharp, well-localized fast pain, followed by a dull, poorly localized, aching sensation of slow pain. 
Fast pain is initiated by firing of AO nociceptors, and the delayed onset of slow pain is directly related to the slower conduction velocity of the C fibers that mediate it. Tissue damage is more complicated than something like skin indentation or muscle strain. Multiple things can cause it, and once it occurs, a series of chemical changes in the damaged tissue ensue. Correspondingly, nociceptors transduce multiple aspects of painful stimuli. AO nociceptors respond specifically to intense mechanical stimulation, example given a pinprick, to painful heat or cold, or to both. C-fiber nociceptors respond to all of these, as well as to a variety of substances released in damaged tissue. For this reason, they are also referred to as polymodal nociceptors. Muscle receptors. Skeletal muscles, like other tissues, contain free nerve endings. Some of these detect muscle pain and others probably keep track of the metabolic status of the muscle. They also contain muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. See figure 9-2 encapsulated receptors that monitor the length and tension of a muscle, respectively. Here we have figure 9-2. We have our contractile region, intrafusal fibers, sensory endings, our capsule, contractile region, motor endings, and anchored it's anchored among extrafusal fibers. This is a muscle spindle, spindle in the lower left. And on the right, a Golgi tendon organs. We have our capsule, our sensory endings, our myelin, our tendon, and muscle fibers. Muscle spindles are small cigar-shaped organs consisting of a few slender intrafusal, or inside the spindle, muscle fibers enclosed in a capsular continuation of the perineurium. They are found in nearly all skeletal muscles just as the packing density of cutaneous receptors is related to the tactile acuity of an area of skin. The number of spindles in a muscle is related to the degree of fine control we have over its contraction. Each intrafusal fiber has a central, nucleated, non-contractile zone with sensory endings wrapped around it, flanked by contractile zones. Both ends of the spindle are anchored in the muscle among the extrafusal, or outside the spindle, muscle fibers. So stretching the muscle also stretches the central zones of the intrafusal fibers and distorts the mechanosensory endings. The contractile portions of the intrafusal fibers are innervated by gamma motor neurons, so-called because their axons are in the AY category, but are too small to generate a significant amount of force. Instead, the power of a muscle is produced by contraction of the extrafusal fibers and contraction of the intrafusal fibers stretches their sensory region, thereby regulating their sensitivity. See figure 47a. This provides an elegant mechanism for maintaining constant sensitivity of a spindle during contraction and relaxation of a muscle. Muscle spindles monitor changes in the length of muscles as a person moves about, providing information important for the coordination of movement and awareness of changes in position. Pharmacology. Relieving pain by suppressing nociceptors. As the membranes of damaged cells begin to break down, arachidonic acid is released. Its conversion to prostaglandins by cyclooxygenase contributes to the inflammation following tissue damage because prostaglandins lower the threshold of nociceptive endings. Aspirin and NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen, help alleviate inflammatory pain by blocking cyclooxygenase. End of pharmacology section. Golgi tendon organs are encapsulated regions of myotendinous
tendinous junctions in which large diameter sensory axons enter the perineural capsule and divide into branches that are interdigitated with the collagen bundles there. Contracting a muscle against resistance squeezes the endings between the collagen bundles, allowing Golgi tendon organs to monitor the tension in a muscle, something that muscle spindles cannot provide much information about. Position sense. Movement at a joint stimulates receptors in the joint itself, changes the length of muscles that insert around the joint, and distorts the skin and subcutaneous tissues surrounding the joint. The CNS uses all of this information both to coordinate movements and for conscious awareness of the position of our parts in space, known as proprioception. The importance of specific receptor types varies at different joints, but in general, muscle spindles play a major role and joint receptors, surprisingly, are the least important. Distribution of somatosensory information in the central nervous system. Each vertebrate sensory system has one collection of receptors that are used for multiple functions, at the very least, feeding into pathways to the cerebral cortex, conscious awareness, into reflex circuitry, and in most or all cases into pathways to the cerebellum as well. As in the somatosensory system, see figure 9.3, this is accomplished by primary afferents that branch repeatedly and make synapses on multiple sets of interneurons on the ipsilateral side of the CNS. Here we have figure 9.3, distribution pattern of somatosensory information in the CS. We have our um, internal capsule. Highlighted over here, connected by the spinothalamaic tract to the spinal cord on its way to the mus or to the spinal cord, and we have the spinocerebellar tract connecting to the spinal cord. Although no one knows exactly why, somatosensory pathways to the cerebral cortex cross the midline. In effect, something touching the left hand causes electrical activity in the right postcentral gyrus. Because both primary afferents and thalamocortical neurons terminate without crossing, at least one additional neuron with an axon that does cross the midline must be involved. With the exception of olfaction, the pathways that convey other kinds of sensory information to the cerebral cortex also involve at least three neurons, but they do not all cross the midline as somatosensory pathways do. Some project bilaterally, examples given vision and hearing, and others are largely uncrossed, example given taste. The olfactory bulb is an outgrowth of the telencephalon and the axons of olfactory receptors project directly to ipsilateral olfactory cortex, bypassing the thalamus. Pathways to the cerebellum do not include a stop in the thalamus, so only two neurons need to be involved, see figure 9.3. Although as discussed in chapter 16, many involve more than two. In addition, the cerebellum affects the ipsilateral side of the body, see figure 524, so most spinocerebellar neurons are uncrossed. Reflexes. Reflexes are automatic responses to sensory inputs such as pupillary constriction in response to bright light and salivation in response to something appetizing. Important reflexes involve somatosensory afferents include, involving somatosensory afferents include the stretch reflex, see figures 223 through 225, figure 224, and figure 225. And the flexor reflex, one that we all know from common experience, it withdraws a body part from a painful stimulus. The stretch reflex is as simple as a reflex can be, involving a large diameter primary afferent from a muscle spindle and a motor neuron that projects back to the same muscle, 
All other reflexes involve one or more interneurons, generally because they affect multiple muscles. Withdrawing an entire limb through a flexor reflex, for example, requires contracting motor neurons and several spinal segments. See figure 9-4. Here we have figure 9-4, circuitry of the flexor reflex, also known as the withdrawal reflex. We have a tack on the floor. Presumably we are pricked by it. Nociceptor sends messages through the DRG to the sacral portion of the spinal cord, sending a message through the Lasseur's tract to the lower lumbar, where messages are then sent back to the muscle. Touch and position. Posterior column medial lemniscus pathway. Sensory axons of all sizes are intermingled in spinal nerves, but as dorsal rootlets approach the spinal cord, the large and small diameter fibers separate from each other. The large diameter axons move medially, enter the ipsilateral posterior funiculus, also called the posterior column and give off numerous branches, see figure 9-3. One of these branches continues rostrally through the spinal cord, forming the first leg of the major pathway that conveys touch and position information to somatosensory cortex, see figure 9-5. Those from the lower extremity form a fasciculus gracilis, or slender bundle, which moves progressively more medially as it ascends to the spinal cord, displaced by similar fibers that enter in more rostral segments and form a fasciculus cuneatus, a wedge-shaped bundle. These two sets of axons then synapse on the second neuron in the pathway, located in nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus, the posterior column nuclei, and the medulla, their axons, in turn, cross the midline in the medulla, forming the medial lemniscus. The medial lemniscus, or ribbon, was so named because it starts out near the midline and is shaped like a ribbon cut in cross-section. The medial lemniscus ascends through the brainstem and terminates in the ventral posterior nucleus of the thalamus and a lateral part called the ventral posterolateral nucleus, or VPL which in turn projects through the posterior limb of the internal capsule to somatory sensory cortex in the postcentral gyrus. Comparable information from the face arrives in the um, trigeminal nerve and terminates a mid-pontine level in the main sensory nucleus of the trigeminal nerve also referred to as the chief sensory or principal sensory nucleus of the trigeminal. Axons arising in the main sensory nucleus cross the midline, join the medial lemniscus, and terminate in the medial part of the ventral posterior nucleus, the ventral posterior medial nucleus, or VPM. So here we have figure 9-5, and we have our brain at the top, medial lemniscus, main sensory nucleus, V ganglion, so the VPL and VPM up top, the nucleus gracilis, the nucleus cunatus, the fasciculus gracilis, the fasciculus cunatus, C8 or cervical 8 and L5, lumbar. The face and body are represented systematically in the post-central gyrus in a distorted somatotopic map. The area devoted to any part is related to the packing density of receptors there. So the somatosensory um, 
homonucleus or homon homunculus actually, a figurative little person, has disproportionately large fingers and lips. Here's the section of the figure that, are, that we're talking about here. This mapping starts way back in the spinal cord where lower extremity fibers are situated medial to upper extremity fibers and continues into the medial limniscus and the pattern of its terminations in the thalamus. Systematic distorted maps are a common feature of sensory systems. Visual cortex, for example, has a retinotopic map with an enlarged area devoted to the central part of the visual field. Different levels of the auditory system contain tonotopic maps with speech frequencies emphasized. Pain and temperature, anterolateral pathway. Pain is different from touch and position in that it has not only a discriminative aspect but also a powerful emotional and motivational component. The discriminative aspect, judging the location, nature, and intensity of a painful stimulus, is similar in all of us and fairly consistent from day to day. The emotional and motivational component, basically how unpleasant the pain is, autonomic responses to it, varies from person to person and from one behavioral situation to another. The anatomic substrate for these dual components is a more widespread distribution of pain information than of touch and position information in the CNS. Warm and cool stimuli, even when innocuous, often feel pleasant or unpleasant and motivate a person to persist in a behavior or change it. This is reflected by a similar distribution of pain and temperature information in the CNS. Pain and temperature pathways begin with small diameter primary afferent fibers that separate from large diameter fibers as the dorsal rootlets join the spinal cord. The AO and C fibers enter the cord lateral to the larger fibers, join Lyser's tract, and divide into ascending and descending branches that distribute synapses to neurons in the posterior horn over several segments. Some of these are interneurons in flexor reflex arcs. Others are tract cells that project to the cerebellum. But many are tract cells with axons that cross the midline and the spinal cord to form the anterolateral pathway. The anterolateral pathway, so-called because of its location in the anterior part of the lateral funiculus, is actually a composite of several tracts, all conveying pain and temperature information. Some constitute the spinothalamic tract, axons that project all the way to VPL and other thalamic, or thalamic nuclei. Others, as well as branches of spinothalamic axons, project to the reticular formation to get the attention of a person in discomfort, to autonomic centers in the brainstem and spinal cord, and to a distinctive area of gray matter surrounding the cerebral aqueduct, the periaqueductal gray. VPL then relays some of this information to somatosensory cortex, subserving the discriminative aspects of pain and temperature sensation, subserving emotional and motivational aspects. So here we have figure 9-6, the anterolateral pathway, VPM, ventral post- um, Euromedial nucleus. We have our brain. Now let's start down here with information coming to L5, transmitted through the spinothalamic tract to C8, to uh, we have a spinal trigeminal nucleus, V ganglion. Up into the brain, we have the VPL again, the VPM again, and other thalamic nuclei. The trigeminal nerve also contributes to this pathway, bringing information about pain and temperature in the face and head. The primary afferents take an unexpected course, see figure 9-6. There are four trigeminal nuclei in the brainstem one motor and three sensory. 
The trigeminal motor nucleus is a collection of motor neurons for the muscles of mastication. The mesencephalic trigeminal nu nucleus, so named because it extends all the way into the midbrain, is notable more for its anatomic weirdness than for its functional importance. It is a slender collection of pseudo-unipolar primary afferent neurons that by right should live in the trigeminal ganglion. The peripheral branches of these neurons innervate mechanoreceptors in and around the temporomandibular joint, and the central branches terminate in the same places as other large diameter trigeminal afferents. The main sensory nucleus, see figure 9.5, is the trigeminal's equivalent of a posterior column nucleus. Finally, the spinal trigeminal nucleus extends from the level of the main sensory nucleus all the way to the cervical spinal cord, where it merges with the posterior horn. Small diameter trigeminal afferents enter the brainstem at a mid-pontine level with the rest of the trigeminal nerve, descend through the spinal trigeminal tract and synapse on the trigeminal's equivalent of spinothalamic tract cells in the part of the spinal nucleus in the caudal med medulla. The reason for this seemingly odd location of second-order neurons is that it completes a somatotopic pain and temperature map that unfolds through progressively more rostral levels of the spinal posterior horn and continues into the spinal trigeminal nucleus. Parts of the spinal trigeminal nucleus in the rostral medulla and caudal pons take part of the remaining spinal cord-like functions, such as relaying trigeminal information to the cerebellum and housing interneurons for the blink reflex, see figure 9A. This is the trigeminal's equivalent of a flexor reflex and results in both eyes blinking in response to something touching either cornea. Figure 9-7, we have the trigeminal nuclei in the brainstem. Here's our spinal trigeminal nucleus, our spinal trigeminal tract, motor nucleus, trigeminal ganglion, main sensory nucleus, and the mesencephalic or the mesencephalic nucleus. In figure 9-8, we have circuitry of the blink reflex. We have the corneal nociceptor and the orbicular oculi, V ganglion, CN7, and um, leading us to the facial motor nucleus. We also have the spinal trigeminal tract and then the spinal trigeminal nucleus. Subsection on pharmacology and clinical medicine. Trigeminal neuralgia. Trigeminal neuralgia is characterized by brief episodes of intense pain in trigeminal territory, usually in one division on one side. Although the mechanism is not known with certainty, many cases are thought to start with abnormal activity in a branch of the trigeminal nerve caused by a pulsating artery impinging on it, followed over time by the development of seizure-like hyperactivity of the spinal trigeminal nucleus. Consistent with this mechanism, Trigeminal neuralgia is most commonly and successfully treated with anticonvulsant agents such as carbamazepine. Control of pain transmission. Subsection on pharmacology, opiates and pain relief. Morphine and other opiate analgesics produce their effects by mimicking the actions of opioid peptides such as enkephalin, endorphin, and dynorphin, manufactured by neurons and used as neurotransmitters. Opioid receptors are widespread in pain-related parts of the CNS and in other parts of the CNS and other parts of the body. Opioid peptides have inhibitory postsynaptic effects and are used by interneurons in the substantia gelatinosa to inhibit transmission from nociceptors to spinothalamic tract cells. They inhibit a tonic inhibition of periaqueductal gray 
pain suppression neurons, thereby activating the system. They even work in the periphery by acting on opioid receptors borne by cells of the immune system. End of subsection. The CNS controls the sensitivity of all its sensory systems, but perhaps nowhere is this more apparent than with pain. Pain serves functions crucial for survival, warning of damage and convincing an animal to protect injured tissues. But in some situations, pain could actually impede survival-related activities. For example, limping slowly away from a threatening situation might not be healthy. To address situations like this and the reverse, lowering the pain threshold when possible pain is anticipated, the nervous system has multiple mechanisms for adjusting the sensitivity of the spinothalamic tract. The best known is a descending pain control pathway that originates in the periaqueductal gray. See figure 99. This area of the midbrain receives converging inputs from the anterolateral pathway from the hypothalamus and from other parts of the limbic system. In situations when pain suppression is appropriate, the periaqueductal gray projects to medullary raphae nuclei and other parts of the reticular formation, which in turn project to the spinal cord and inhibit the transmission of information from pain and temperature afferents to spinothalamate tract cells. Here we have figure 9-9, mediation of descending pain controlled by the periaqueductal gray, or PAG from the hypothalamus amygdala and cerebral cortex to the thalamus, uh, thalamus periaqueductal gray. We have our raphe nuclei, our spinothalamic tract, 